let's look at polymers. Okay, and I mean specifically, actually, I'm I'm talking today about plastic polymers. That is, polymers that can plastically deform, and their last um, stress their tensile stress drain behavior. So we're going to load up a sample in tension, and of course, because it's a polymer, it's ductile. The gold standard way to do the test would be to get a little tensile specimen like this. And there's one, not my best, but oh, that's awful, awful. Let's fix that. Oh. So, uh, well, there you go. It's it's supposed to look better than that, but uh, anyway, we um, so we take this and uh, load it up. And get a curve that looks something like this. Okay, the interesting thing about this curve is that it continues to load bear. In fact, this could be quite elongated. Um, it continues to load bear and get a lot of strain even after the onset of necking. Okay, so at the onset of necking, of course, you get there we go, a little localized plastic deformation. So that's what I've tried to draw here, just a little bit where the sample has got quite narrow. Um, doesn't have to happen actually right in the middle. Perhaps I shouldn't have put it right in the middle there. But uh, anywhere in this reduced section here, somewhere in the reduced section, the um, neck will form. And the interesting thing about um, polymers, or I mean one of the many interesting things, of course they're super exciting, um, is that that neck, see in a metal, that neck is where it's going to break each and every time. It's the beginning of fracture. But for a polymer, stretch that out a bit, it uh, can continue to load bear even after it's necked. So what you see is you actually see this um, elongation, uh, clean that up, of the neck. So that should be a little surprising to you um, if you are familiar with the mechanical behavior of metals, where in contrast, as soon as it necks, the stress goes up way too high, the metal can't get strong um, enough, fast enough, and it fractures. Whereas in a polymer, there's there's something. I mean, clearly there has to be some mechanism in here that's allowing the polymer to get stronger more rapidly than the stress is increasing due to the smaller cross-sectional area. And the other thing that's neat to note here is that you know the once the elongation occurs here in the middle, the the polymer is getting stronger in that region that I've highlighted in white there. Or actually, what I could do is I could make it, just for kicks, I'll make it blue. Okay, and I'll say, look, the polymer is stronger there. Than, okay, and the stress is higher just on either side of it. Why? Because the cross-sectional area has decreased, and the polymer hasn't yet got as strong as it is in this little middle section. So what we need to do is okay, we understand that the polymer has gotten stronger and it's gotten stronger significantly. So what we need to do is we need to understand how a polymer gets so strong um, during this um, plastic deformation in the neck. Strengthening by, um, sometimes it's called drawing. Um, that's the action of elongating and tension, okay? And the thing is, though, to understand that, we need to dive into the, um, the, the microstructure of a polymer a little bit more, de more detail. So first thing we need to do is look at the undeformed polymer, and then what I'll look at is the deformed polymer. And we're going to go down to, you know, roughly the... Um, the sort of the atomic level, or in this case, really the molecular level. And so often polymers are described as these great long uh, chains. Okay, now we're not going to get into a lot of the chemistry yet, but these things are um, often referred to, like I said, as chains. And we don't need to know too much more than the fact that you could imagine, well, a chain is made up of links, right? 
A chain has all these links, and each link is essentially the same as the other. And in polymers, in, in much the same way, have little links. And, you know, often they've got some simple chemistry like this. That's so messy. So messy. Let me make that a little more clear. Okay, so maybe carbon bonded to carbon with hydrogens all around it. That's what we call polyethylene. Okay, um, not the purpose of this particular uh, video to understand that, but if you imagine that, okay, that's the chemistry. Those are some elements, some little atoms. They're all held together by strong bonds, and you link them up together. That's what this uh, each of these lines that I've drawn here is. So each of these lines is a chain um, or a molecule. But often, the convenience of a simple word like chain is is uh, makes it worthwhile to just use that. So then, okay, that's fine. They, they're all in the undeformed condition. They're randomly um, oriented. And the name for that is amorphous amorphous that is it has no structure okay move that over okay so it's randomly oriented or amorphous and then what happens when we start to elongate it and remember we're elongating it in this example up and down uh, in, the, in the vertical axis okay so then those same chains and I'm, I'm exaggerating of course in this cartoon sketch but those same chains now start to stretch out as you as you pull it up and down the chains or the molecules orient with the loading axis. So now they're organized, or we'll say that they're crystalline. Uh, the polymer has some crystallinity, it has some organization. And this is important for a couple of reasons. One, well, because the bonds that are holding the, these links together this carbon to this carbon, for example, are, are strong. So these bonds here are strong bonds. The strong bonds are now oriented up and down in the loading axis. So you're stretching strong bonds. And so we, in fact, notice um, an increase in the elastic constant. Okay, it gets stiffer, if you will. Right, it gets stiffer. I mean, remember, that's that's not a great word to use, but intuitively it gives us some description of it. It becomes st the, the, the slope of the curve, the stress-strain curve, it actually becomes steeper if you carefully study just this organized region. But also, you get more of these weaker bonds. These chains are now organized. They're really close together. It's almost like there's more um, friction. If you, again, go with this chain model, or you imagine that they're spaghetti or something, and they're all lined up really close to each other, then you get more of these little things I'm drawing with the red. Uh, it's supposed to be, you know, frictional forces in, in this mechanical analogy here. Um, really, they're, they're secondary bonds. Um, or these weaker interactions, but there's there's more of them. The important thing is that there's more of these frictional or um, weak. I'll just call them weak for now because we haven't formally covered um, you know, secondary bonding. But uh, if you're familiar with that, that's that's fantastic. Those are secondary bonds, and you get more of these weak secondary bonds, uh, more weak bonds between chains and that makes it harder for one chain to slide past the other so now you're stretching strong bonds along the axis it gets stiffer and it's more difficult to pull one of these chains away from the other because of all these extra secondary uh, or, or frictional type um, interactions and so what we see is this gets extremely strong in this neck and the in fact it gets so strong that it doesn't break immediately in the neck uh, especially if you load it at a nice uh, slow strain rate. So it gets strong there, and then what happens is it just elongates, and this, this uh, um, neck region gets even longer and, and longer. At this point, we, um, we know that, we, we, well, sorry, we understand why the, the polymer doesn't break there. We see it's gotten stronger. The last thing to do is just a little bit of uh, sort of... Uh, 
terminology, if you will, and as maybe it might seem unexciting, uh, but it's important uh, nonetheless. It's exciting, and hopefully you'll, you'll find it exciting at some point. Um, but so we, we need to again address this issue that we that we had dealt with with uh, metals. And where are we going to define um, a strength? Okay. Um, so that's a specific value of stress. What are some specific values of stress that we're interested in for polymers? So first of all, where it starts to plastically deform. Now, a polymer has such a huge strain here. This is very, very large um, that we don't need to really mess around with, with a, a definition like the 0.2% offset, we can find a point on the curve that's, that's um, easy to identify. And, and for us, in, in this case, um, the, the peak of the curve there is, is relatively easy to identify. And it's relatively conservative because there's so much strain to failure for a polymer. And so that's what we define for a polymer as the yield strength. And then by convention, this strength here is, is actually called the tensile strength. All right, so that's a little different from the definitions that we use for metals. But once you understand, um, you know, why the yield strength is, is easily determined there as that peak, and that's a conservative value to use, uh, that uh, should be fine. And it's just a matter of remembering that the convention is to call the fracture uh, point there, the tensile strength, when you're referring to the mechanical behavior of a polymer. All right, excellent.